Hello everyone and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for Free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going to be going through topic 7, um, populations, abiotic and biotic factors. For this part of topic 7, the populations, there's a lot of key terms that can come up as just one or two mark questions in the exam. So these would be great to turn into flashcards or just to test yourself. You can screenshot and take a copy of this table. So populations is a two mark definition. And your definition is it's a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area at the same time. That first part is one mark. The second mark is that they can interbreed to make fertile offspring. Habitat would just be one mark, so it's the part of an ecosystem in which particular organisms live. Community, so this is all populations or all the populations of different species in the same area at the same time. And it is essentially the same, say, in the same area at the same time. The ecosystem, so that is the community and the non-living components of the environment. So essentially the biotic and the abiotic factors. And you need to have an awareness that the ecosystems can range in size from being very small to very large, like global. Niche, this is often a two mark definition as well. So it's an organism's role within an ecosystem, including its position in the food web, but also its habitat. And it's normally split as it's an organism's role within an ecosystem, and then the second mark is also the habitat also. And each species occupies its own niche, and no two species can occupy the same. And if they do try, then that's when you get competition and one species will eventually be outcompeted. Carrying capacity is the maximum population size that an ecosystem can support. And if you exceed that carrying capacity, there then won't be enough resources for all of the individuals and they'll start to die and that will then bring it back to the carrying capacity level. Abiotic factors are the non-living conditions of an ecosystem that affect the survival of individuals. And the biotic factors are the impacts of the interactions between organisms. So the size of a population does vary. And that's varying depending on mainly these two factors, the abiotic factors they're exposed to and the biotic factors. And in particular, we're going to be looking at competition. So first of all, then abiotic factors. So within the definition, we said that these are the non living components um, of the ecosystem. So, for example, that could be the temperature. Um, oxygen, and now that is particularly important if we are talking about an aquatic ecosystem, so the amount of oxygen dissolved in the water, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or again, it could be dissolved in water, light intensity, pH of soil, um, it could be mineral content of soil. So just bear in mind that it's not sufficient to say climate is an abiotic factor you'd really need to pick out which aspect of the climate because climate could link to um, the amount of precipitation temperature light intensity and plants and animals are adapted to the abiotic factors within their ecosystem so you could get some questions linked to adaptations um, and if you think about different plant species adaptations to very little water content in the soil could be very, very extensive root networks or plants growing very broad leaves to try and get more um, a larger surface area to obtain light. And these adaptations link to the topic of natural selection because it would take many, many generations before the entire species possessed that particular adaptation. One thing linked to abiotic factors is the less harsh the abiotic factors and what I mean by that is you have plenty of all the conditions you need. So it could be plenty of water, light, um, that would then mean that that particular ecosystem is able to support a much larger range of species and each species will be able to have a larger population size. So that's why I've got these two images just to demonstrate that point. So we've got the bottom picture just showing that we've got plenty of water availability. We can see lots of blue sky, lots of sunshine as well. So just thinking about those two abiotic factors has enabled, we can see a whole range of different plant species. There will be animals as well, but we can't see those in this image 
there's lots of different plant species and there's lots of them. Whereas the top picture, we can see far harsher abiotic factors. So in the desert, we can see that the soil must be very low in nutrients because it looks more like sand, very little water content. There is lots of sunlight available, um, but if there's not much nutrients or water in the soil, that's going to make growth and photosynthesis challenging. And for that reason, we can see there are very, very few different plant species. And in fact, it looks in this image that potentially we can only see one. There won't only be one, but there's far fewer plant species and species in general. There'll be fewer animals as well. And you'll also find there are fewer individuals within each species. So the population sizes will be smaller. So that is how abiotic factors affect the population size. So the next factor to consider is biotic factors. And these are the living components of an ecosystem. But it's not just thinking about living components. It's looking at how different organisms interact together. And that's where it leads us on to competition. And in particular, we'll be looking at predation. So competition, this is the same as it was at GCSE. So you have two different types of competition, interspecific, so T-E-R, and that is when it is organisms between different species competing. Intraspecific, so T-R-A, is when members of the same species are competing. Now, in both types of competition, whether it's between the same species or different species, there will be competition for space. Uh, it could be for food, water. But the key difference is members of the same species will also be competing for mates. And that's where this then links to courtship rituals. And I'll link the video for courtship rituals just up here. So if you haven't seen that, you can check out courtship rituals. So that takes us on to the predator-prey relationships. So the interactions between predators and prey within a particular ecosystem will typically follow this style graph. And you could be asked to either describe or explain the patterns on a predator-prey graph. And what I've just done is picked out the key patterns that you will see for any species. So although we've got hair and lynx, hair being the prey and lynx being the predator, you will typically see these three patterns, whichever predator and prey you are given. So number one, the size of the predator and the prey population both fluctuate. So that's the first thing we can see. You don't have this static population size. Both of them are going up and down, up and down, up and down. And that is because as you get this increase in prey, that is then more food for the predators. So the predators get more food. That means they can reproduce more and you get more predators. But as you get more predators, that means there's more of them to eat the prey. So the population of prey decreases. When the population of prey decreases, there's then not enough food for the predators. So they start to die out. And again, you just get this pattern happening on loop over and over and over. So that is the first pattern. There will always be more prey than predators. Now for that one, I'm just going to tweak that slightly to say the prey population will always peak at a higher point because you might sometimes see um, that occasionally there are more predators than prey, but overall you tend to have more prey than predators and the prey peak in population size is always higher. And that's because the predators are further along the food chain. And that means whatever they are eating will contain less energy because energy is wasted at every trophic level. So in order for them to gain enough energy from their food, they have to eat more of that particular animal. So to be able to stay, to sustain one lynx, they will eat, need to be eating multiple prey. So you won't typically see more predators than the food source, the prey, for that reason. The last pattern is the size of the population will always change in the prey first, and then there's this lag time before the predator population changes. And that's what we can see quite clearly in um, 19, sorry, 1845. We have this increase in the prey population, 
And then it's not until um, a year or so later that you start to see the increase in the predator population. Then the prey population decreases first and then the predator population decreases. So you get this lag time as well. So that is it for the abiotic and biotic factors, population keywords and factors affecting populations. If you have found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up today.